followed by words from Buddhist tradition. Then we'll have a moment of silent prayer and meditation. And then we'll sing the meditation music 1031. Please remain seated. Einstein. A human being experiences the self, one's thoughts and feelings, is something separated from other people. This is a kind of optical illusion of consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for but a few persons nearest us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of understanding and compassion to embrace all living creatures in the whole of nature in its beauty. Buddha said, true happiness comes not from limited concerns for one's own well-being or that of those one feels close to, but from developing love and compassion for all sentient. Just a words to clarify a couple of things. Uh, Earlier in the service, someone mentioned the Chicago Cubs. And if you started coming here after the year 2006, you'll have no idea what that's about. <laughs> My religious journey is following baseball. I'm a devotee, not a fan, a devotee, which means religiously follow the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> and they've taught me everything I know about loss and suffering. And the miracle is that today they're in first place, and usually by this time of year they've been mathematically eliminated. <laughs> I don't know if Einstein ever played baseball, but I know a few other things about him. He was born in 1879. He lived to the age of 76. He died in 1955. In this Time magazine has always had a, per a person of the year. They, they have a cover issue, the last issue in December, in which they, they name, it used to be the man of the year, and now it's the person of the year. But in 1999, Time magazine named Einstein person of the century. This is what they said. Einstein was the preeminent scientist in a century dominated by science. The touchstones of the century, the bomb, the Big Bang, quantum physics, and electronics all bear his imprint. Unquote. Growing up, Einstein was a pudgy child of a bourgeois Jewish couple in southern Germany. He was musically gifted. His musically inclined mother encouraged his passion for the violin and for the composers Bach, Mozart, and Schubert. He had a brief fling with religion as a child, which culminated in his chiding his secular Jewish parents for eating pork. His interest in religion was soon supplanted with his fervor for science. He early on began exploring introductory science books in what he called his holy little geometry book. Five years old, holy little geometry book. He developed what was to become a lifelong suspicion of all authority, not just religious authority, all, relig all authority. He conducted his first thought experiment at the age of five when his engineering father gave him a toy compass. What, the five-year-old questioned, makes the needle always point north? He was left behind at a prep school at the age of 15 when the rest of his family, for business purposes, moved to northern Italy. 15 years old, you're on your own, you're in Germany. Family went to northern Italy. Einstein quit the prep school, remember now he's 15, in protest of its militarism. He renounced his German citizenship because of the militarism, later going to school at the Zurich Polytechnic, which is the Swiss equivalent of our MIT. He married, he moved to Berlin. His wife and he had three sons the first of which they gave up for adoption. I'm not certain what the reason for that was, but they gave up the first trial for adoption, and he, he and his wife eventually divorced, and he, he remarried a divorced cousin. At the height of World War I, he and three other scientists signed an anti-war petition, the only three Germans to do so, and this angered the Kaiser and put 
Einstein's career in jeopardy, put his life in jeopardy. During the 1920s, the Jews were singled out by the Nazis as the cause for Germany's defeat in World War I. Einstein also occurred the wrath of the communists who considered his theory of relativity an example of rampant individualism. Think about it. The communists preached collectivism. Einstein was preaching what looked like individualism. And so anyway, he, he couldn't please, please either path. He incurred the wrath of many church leaders because they considered him ungodly. He left Germany to escape Nazi persecution. He came here to Princeton, New Jersey to work. He became a passionate Zionist. He also spoke for the protection of Arab rights in the proposed Jewish state. He was a pacifist, but he also spoke up early for the need to oppose Hitler by military action. He was a pacifist. He said, in order to stop Hitler, we need to fight. Gandhi, by the way, drove an ambulance for the, for the military during the Second World War, and he also made speeches encouraging Indians to join the effort against the Nazis. He wrote to the president, FDR, warning him of the possibility that the Germans were trying to build an atom bomb. After Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he spoke out against the bomb. He told, he told FDR, you better look out, because they, so we went ahead and, took, and developed the bomb, and then after the, that, we used it. He was, was very upset and spoke out against it. After the war, he campaigned for a ban on nuclear weapons. He denounced McCarthyism, racism, and bigotry. Life magazine listed him, get this now, Life magazine, this is like in the 50s. He listed, they listed Einstein as a communist dupe and fellow traveler. At that time, time and, and life were very conservative, very right wing. After the war, he urged the Allied countries to set up a world government, kind of like the United Nations, in order to try and control the atom bomb. He saw the need for the world to get together to keep the use of the atom bomb down. He was offered the presidency of the new state of Israel in 1952, but he declined, saying, this is great. Politics is for the moment, an equation is for eternity. <laughs> in effect, his equation for the theory of general relativity became his epitaph and memorial. If you think of the equation, you think of Einstein. It's as simple as all that. In the year of 1905, at the time, a 26-year-old patent examiner, he, he worked as a patent examiner in Switzerland. He'd review people's applications for patents and decide whether they should be given or not. He was unaffiliated with any university. Nobody knew of him. Albert, Stein, Albert Einstein seemingly came out of nowhere. He published five revolutionary scientific papers, which in effect changed our worldview. Nobody knew who he was. He wrote these five scientific papers. Of course, first all the scientists thought he was a crackpot, but then they started to find out that he was telling what, the way it was. And by the way, he worked out these equations in science, first of all by insight and then by developing the formulas, not the other way around. He, he didn't do the math and then come, he, he intuited. His special theory of relativity established that space and time are relative. Now, I grew up thinking that space and time were two different things, but they're not. They're not at, out of the special relativity came the world's most famous for, formula, E equals mc squared. Energy is equivalent to the mass of a thing multiplied by the speed of light squared. Speed of life as far as we know, nothing can go faster than the speed of life. It's huge. And then you square that, when you multiply it by itself, and then you take the mass of something. This is why you can take a little bit of material like that and explode it and, and take down a country. This is what E equals MC squared said. This led to development of the atom bomb, which he opposed, and led it to nuclear power for peaceful use. His work on radiation led to the theory of photons and light and then to quantum theory. His work laid the groundwork for a novel argument for the existence of atoms. You could, 
Back then, you couldn't prove that atoms existed. He, his groundwork laid the groundwork where you laid the groundwork. You could actually show this. This is what it, there are atoms. He spent his later years searching for a theory of everything, driven by his belief that a deeper, unifying theory could be found which showed the interrelationship of everything that exists. He was working on the fauna that could show that. People are still looking for it. He, he, he couldn't find it. They're still looking for that insight. He was horrified by the randomness and unpredictability shown in the basic law of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the laws that apply subatomic. And what this is very random and very, you know, the, the uh, famous, if you, if you know the speed of an atom, you can't know its location. This is, it's random. Okay. He expressed his belief saying, God does not play dice. This, by the way, is the only, the only time I, I know of that Einstein was wrong. <laughs> God does play dice, and quantum theory shows it. He hated chaos and revolution. This is why he opposed it. He hated chaos and revolution for its own sake. He was devoted to constancy as much as to relativity. He insisted that the world ultimately has to be understandable. He believed the world to be a puzzle created for us to figure out. It is the purpose of us, humankind, to solve as much as possible of the puzzle. This is why we send probes to Mars, for example. We're trying to figure out the mysteries of existence. We are to use reason insight, mathematics, to see into the ultimate structures of the universe. This is what I says. This is why we're here on Earth. Einstein says, if we trace out what, behold, what we behold and experience through the landscape of logic, we are doing science. If we show it in forms whose interrelationships are not accessible to conscious thought, but are instinctively recognized as meaningful, meaningful we are doing art and religion. Art and religion, instinct, not less true, but it's not provable. Common to both art and science is devotion to something beyond the personal. The artist and the scientist are doing the same thing. They're devoted to something beyond the personal, removed from the arbitrary. Both science and art reveal the mysterious connections that undergird our lives, and the religious sensibility knows this as truth. When I look at, great, at, a, at a work of art, I intuit it. I, just look, I don't try to explain it. Or I just look at it, and I get it. It's intuitive. It's intuitive. Einstein's God was not personal. It was a higher intelligence operating in the structure and the laws of the universe. You figure out the structure and the laws of the universe, and then you know God. My religion, he said, consists of a humble admiration of the illimitable superior spirit, which reveals itself in the slight details we are able to perceive with all our frail and feeble insights. He wasn't this proud scientist who knew it all. He was, he was a person who knew how much we didn't know. Science, this is, this is what Einstein said. Science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. He lived in dedication to truth, beauty, and justice. Those were his highest values, truth, beauty, and justice. His belief was that there are laws which we can discover by observing nature. That brings me back to Annie Dillard, the, the reading I opened with. She sat at the creek for one year and observed, and then based on that, she said what she, what she learned, her truths. Science, he said, can only ascertain what is, not what should be. Value judgments are outside of science's domain. Religion deals only with evaluations of human thought and action. Religion cannot speak of fact. You want to get a you want to get a fundamentalist upset, you say this to them. <laughs> Albert, St Albert Einstein wrote a lot about what he believed. And what I've done here is I've condensed what he believed in some... These are not his words, but these are what he said he believed. Strange is our situation here on earth. Each of us comes for a short visit, not knowing why, yet sometimes we figure out a purpose. There is one thing we do know... We are here for the sake of other people. 
above all for those upon whose smile and well-being our own happiness depends, and also for the countless unknown souls with whose fate we are connected by a bond of sympathy. I must exert myself in order to give others as much as I have received from others. This is why I don't, th- I don't think the communist critique of him being an individual is wrong. He says we, we are interconnected. We must not take ourselves too seriously. I love this one. We must not take ourselves too seriously. We are saved by a sense of humor. What could be funnier than that picture of Einstein with his hair like, like he stuck his hand in a socket? Without my collaborating with like-minded people in pursuit of the ever unattainable, ever unattainable in art and scientific research, my life would have been empty. In other words, the search, his life search was his purpose in life. Possessions, outward success, publicity, luxury, to me these have always been contemptible. I believe a simple and unassuming, unassuming manner of life is best. My political ideal is democracy. Everyone should be respected as an individual. No one should be idolized. This would be his critique against Christianity. You, you take a man and elevate him to the status of God, God, Godhead. You, you can't do that in Jewish theology, and you can't do it in Einstein's way of thinking. Distinctions separating people into social classes are false. By the way, uh, one of the things, Buddha, is, Buddha essentially, I look at him as a person who reformed Hinduism. He's a Hindu and he reformed it. He was the Martin Luther of, of Hinduism. And one of the things he fought against Buddha was the was this caste system, not my system, the C-A-S-T-E, that system. <laughs> what is truly valuable in life is not the nation, but the creative and impressionable personality, the one who produces the noble and the sublime, the individual, the person who produces. War is low and despicable. And I had rather be smitten to shreds than to participate in a war. The most beautiful things we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. To know that what is impenetrable to us really exists. Manifesting itself is the highest wisdom and the most radiant beauty which our dull faculties can comprehend. Only in the most primitive forms, this knowledge, this feeling, is at the center of true religiousness. In this sense, and in this sense only, I belong to the ranks of devoutly religious people. He was, he was religious at the real root meaning of the word, searching for truth and then living the truth. That's what religion is, and that's what he did. He said, it is enough for me to contemplate the mystery of conscious life perpetuating itself through all eternity to reflect upon the marvelous structure of the universe and to humbly try to understand even an infinitesimal part of the intelligence manifested in nature. So what I've been talking about so far is would be Einstein's answer to one of the five big questions that all religions deal with. How do I know what is true? What's the nature of truth? What are my sources of truth? This is what he was talking about. Einstein's answer would have been insight, intuition, science, mathematics, physics. He envisioned it and intuited E equals MC squared before he derived the formula. Einstein was a man of science to uncover the truth scientifically. What's the scientific method? You come up with an hypothesis. The earth is round. That would have been very, no one would have believed that back in the old days. That's your hypothesis. Then you experiment, and then you look at the results of the experiments, you uncover a truth, and then it has to be rep- replicated. This is the scientific method. Now let's talk about Buddha a little bit. He was born a man of privilege. He was wealthy. By the way, we know about Buddha the same as we know about Jesus. Absolutely nothing about that. It's a myth of Buddha and the myth of Jesus that we know. So Buddha was a man of privilege, living in luxury. He left the home of privilege. Some say that he was a, well, tradition says he was a prince. He left home, became poor in order to seek the truth. 
In his pursuit of truth, led him to try all kinds of approaches, all of which failed him. He tried living in poverty. He tried rambunctiousness. He tried every, all kinds of ways you could, all the spiritual ways you can think of, and they, none of it worked. And then late in life, it was late in life, he was sitting under the Bodhi tree, Bodhi tree, emptying his mind. He received from his unconscious insight and understanding. It wasn't until he emptied his mind and all those thoughts that he came to enlightenment. Buddha's path is the path of the mystic. The mystical method is to empty yourself, open yourself, and to observe and receive insight, then to articulate the insight. That's mysticism. Both scientism and mysticism lead to the same truths, and they are complementary. If science tells us one thing and religion tells us another thing, that's not possible. There's only one truth. As Annie Dillard, once again, to come back to Annie Dillard, as she wrote, this is one of my favorite all-time sayings. Annie Dillard wrote, both the priest in the cathedral and the scientist in the lab are seeking the same thing, answers from beyond themselves. I'm going to say a few things now, a few examples of, of Einstein and Buddha. What they, I'm going to do a couplets. What Einstein said and what Buddha said, I'm going to do it. And it's your job to see how they're the same thing. Different words, but the same. By the way, Buddha and Einstein were separated by 2,500 years, so I'm not saying that they collaborated on this. <laughs> Einstein, human beings can attain a worthy and harmonious life only if they're able to rid themselves within the limits of human nature of striving to fulfill the wishes of material kind. Buddha, people driven on by thirst, run about like a snared rabbit. Let therefore the mendicant, the poor person, drive out thirst by striving after passionless detach detachment of the self. So Buddha taught you have to detach yourself from yourself. And this is what Einstein said. You, Einstein, the true value of a person is determined primarily by the measure and the sense in which one has attained liberation from the self. Buddha. The perfect person has no self. By the way, Jesus also, I, I always thought that many of Jesus' teachings came directly from Buddha. And this is one case, you know, like getting rid of the self, becoming like a child again. Einstein, truth is what stands the test of experience. Einstein, truth is what tests the test of experience. If I can't experience it, it can't be true. Buddhism, the real meaning of the way must be directly experienced. Einstein, failure and deprivation are the best educators and purifiers. I don't like this one, but it's, they said it so. Failure and deprivation are the best educators. And then Buddha said, difficult circumstances become an encouragement for the accomplishment of spiritual development. When people tell me that, oh, well, don't, don't worry, your father died, but that's for your own benefit. You'll, you'll, you'll learn from it. Well, these people said that's true. Einstein, all our science measured against reality is primitive and childlike. Buddhism, calculate what we know and it cannot compare to what we do not know. New Isaac Newton was one of my favorite, favorite scientists. He was also a Unitarian. And Isaac Newton said famously, every scientific truth I uncover, I uncover nine more questions. That's the true scientist. Einstein, physical concepts are free, free creations of the human mind and are not, however it may seem, uniquely determined by the external world. Everything physical is, is not external. You do, you do. Buddha, all such notions as causation, succession, atoms, primary elements are figments of the imagination and manifestations of the mind. Einstein, there is no essential distinction between mass and energy. That's what his formula says, E equals MC, interchangeable. Energy is mass and mass represents energy. Buddhism, only an arbitrary distinction is th in thought divides form of substance from form of energy. Matter expresses itself as a form of some unknown energy. He said that 2,500 years before, before Einstein. 
Einstein, the distinction between the past, present, and future is only a stubborn, persistent illusion. Buddhism, the past, the future are nothing but names, merely superficial realities. There's a new theory called string theory, which is trying to prove, and if you follow spring, which I can't, but if you do follow, I am told that it's right now, in the present, the future and the past are all present right now in the present. This is what string theory says. And that's what Einstein and Buddhism both said. We live in an amazing world. Life is a gift. It is a precious gift to be alive. That's my answer. How are you doing, Charlie? Oh, it's great to be alive. It is our job to be the ears and eyes and voice of the earth. We are the earth alive. It is our job, as Einstein said, the world is a puzzle which is created for us to decipher using reason, intuition. It is our job to give meaning to our lives and to find meaning in our lives in relationships with all other living beings. When you peer into the ultimate structure of the universe, what truths do you find which guide your life? 